Welcome to our Easter worship service. We're glad that you joined. To begin our worship service, we want to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ by reading the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 through 6. Join with me by reading the words given on the screen. Matthew 28. After the Sabbath, at the dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, he is risen. Just as he said, yes, he is not here, he is risen, hallelujah.
Christ the Lord is risen today. Easter, everyone. If you've been following along with our family Easter event, you'll know that on Friday we talked about Jesus' death and resurrection. Now today we get to celebrate Jesus coming back to life. Now on that first Easter Sunday though, when Jesus was first uh, risen from the grave, not everyone was celebrating. Let's see what happened. On the day that Jesus rose from the dead, Two of Jesus' disciples were walking to a village called Emmaus. The two disciples were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked, Jesus came and began to walk with them, but the disciples did not recognize him. Jesus asked the disciples, What are you talking about? The disciples stopped walking. They looked sad. One of the disciples, Cleopas, answered, Are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what happened? What happened, Jesus asked. So they told him. Jesus of Nazareth was a prophet. He was powerful when he acted and spoke before God and all the people. The religious leaders handed Jesus over to be sentenced to death, and they nailed him to a cross. We had hoped he was the one who would set Israel free. Besides, it's the third day since these things happened. Early this morning, some women went to the tomb and did not find Jesus' body. They saw angels who said that Jesus is alive. Some of our friends went to the tomb and they too saw that the tomb was empty. Jesus said, you are foolish to not believe what the prophet said. Isn't this what had to happen to the Messiah? Then, beginning with Moses and the prophets, Jesus explained to them what all the scriptures said about him. Jesus and the two disciples arrived at Emmaus and they asked Jesus to stay with them. So Jesus joined them at the dinner table. 
He took the bread, thanked God for it, and broke it into pieces. Then he gave the pieces to the disciples. Right away, the men recognized Jesus, but Jesus immediately disappeared from their sight. The two disciples thought about their walk to Emmaus. They said, when Jesus talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures, didn't our hearts feel like they were on fire? The disciples immediately left Emmaus and went back to Jerusalem. They found Jesus' 11 disciples and others who gathered with them. They told them what had happened. They said, Simon saw Jesus too. Jesus is alive. The whole Bible is about Jesus. When Adam and Eve sinned, God began working out his plan to send Jesus to rescue people from sin. All of the Old Testament points forward to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, the time when Jesus would bring God's promised salvation for sinners. So how did Jesus' followers react when they heard that the tomb was empty? Yeah, they were kind of upset, weren't they? Should they have been upset? No, they shouldn't have. In fact, Jesus had to come and tell them, listen, you've been hearing about this all your life. You've heard what the prophets have said. You've heard what I've told you that this was going to happen. Okay? Now, let me see if I can explain this a little bit better to you, maybe how the disciples were thinking at that time. Um, how many of you like to do puzzles? Yep, I love to do puzzles. I like the big ones. This, is, this was a 550-piece puzzle. They're a lot of fun to do. But the thing is, with puzzles, no matter how big it is, you need to see the whole picture in order to do the puzzle, okay? Or it'd be a whole lot harder, wouldn't it? So we can see this big picture because otherwise these little pieces, you know, they don't make a whole lot of sense to us. Or we don't see how it fits into this until we see the whole picture. And that's kind of how it was with Jesus' disciples at that time. They had all these little pieces and things that they knew and had studied, but they couldn't see the whole picture of how that worked with the story of the Bible. See, we can see that now. We have the Bible. We know what happened to Jesus. We know that he died and rose again and what happened after that. The disciples didn't really get that. They were still looking at the little pieces, okay? So now when we look at the Bible and we see all those little pieces in the Old Testament and such, we see how they work together in the whole story of the Bible. So you see that all scripture points to Jesus, okay? Now throughout the Old Testament, we see how God promised his people a savior. They knew that they were sinners, but God promised them a savior is coming, a savior is coming. Well, guess what? We are sinners. We need a savior as well, just like the people in the Old Testament did. But here's the good news. The Savior's already here. He's already come. Jesus has already died and risen again. And we know that when we trust in him, we can have eternal life through him. And that's something to celebrate, not just on Easter, but every day throughout the year. Thanks for tuning in to our Easter worship service this morning. Uh, we're glad to, to connect with you this way. And over this time when we cannot gather, we would still like to keep connected with you. And one of the best ways to do that is through our cfcnewholland.org website. Uh, click on the updates tab and then you can see what's available each week. Uh, also, please stay connected with us as pastoral staff uh, via our cells or emails. And also connect with our office staff via the church email. Uh, for those of you who are here that are our guests and friends, we have a free subscription to Right Now Media. Right Now Media is a Christian Netflix that provides a lot of great entertainment and educational programs for people of all ages. Uh, request a link by sending an email to cfc at cfcnewholland.org. If you're not getting our weekly things to know, um, email the church that gives a things to know happening in our church email the church office and let them know that you would like to be added to that list and to the members and regular attenders of cfc thanks so much for your faithful giving over this time you can continue to give online through tithely or an ach from the your bank you can mail your offering checks to the church address and the, ch the church mail is picked up daily and placed in a safe place. 
but thank you for participating in our worship today. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong. Who holds our days within His hand? What comes apart from His command? And what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stay. Well, good morning and happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I came across a story recently of a, of a gentleman in the country of Japan who was quite upset. In fact, he was eventually arrested for, of all things, excessive complaining. Apparently, he was upset with his telephone provider, service provider, uh, he didn't have, among other things, radio signals coming in on his phone. And so he began to call this company many, many times, over and over and over again. And it got to the point where he was calling hundreds of times a week. Well, finally, after 24,000 telephone calls, he was arrested 
and charged with what the authorities called fraudulent obstruction of business. Sources say that with Japan's aging population, they need more outlets for expressing their frustration. Well, I'm sure many of us here could relate in some way to what this gentleman was experiencing, maybe not this particular issue, but, but dealing with frustrations, no matter what our age may be, and especially during the current pandemic with the restrictions and mandates that have been imposed upon us. Some of us are starting to go a little stir crazy, and I just heard, unfortunately, this morning of an increase in psychiatric treatments and heroin overdoses and other things, domestic violence. And so it is having an effect. Many, of course, are dealing with life-altering experiences, things like postponements or even cancellations of graduations, of weddings and honeymoons, of birthday and anniversary milestones. These events normally hold great significance and meaning for us as people. And understandably, it's quite painful for those that cannot participate in them. But, you know, even before this crisis began, Many people experience other kinds of life-altering experiences. The death of a loved one, the loss of a job, the loss of a scholarship or educational opportunity, the end of a relationship or marriage, or maybe a life-threatening diagnosis. And while many of us can and do eventually recover from such ordeals, then in the moment, as we are experiencing them, they can be very devastating, even life-shattering. Well, 2,000 years ago, Jesus' disciples experienced what we might call a life-shattering event. And the question is, can we today, 2,000 years later, learn anything from this incident? Let's find out. I invite you, if you have a Bible handy, to turn to Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 24. And in Luke's cha chapter 24, we're given an account very similar to what Pastor Dave read earlier in this service about the details of that first Easter morning, the discovery that the tomb of Jesus was in fact empty. And then some women who said they, they saw angels appear to them and talk to them and tell them that Jesus in fact was alive. And then Peter and later John ran to the tomb to see if these things were so. But following that story, which is common in, in most of the Gospels, we have an account now in the, in the Gospel of Luke that is unique to him. And I'm going to read beginning in verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. And then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of our company, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him, they did not see. This past week, as many are doing now, my wife and I took a walk. Enjoy the beautiful weather that we've had so far here in April. 
And near our house is a very large and very old cemetery. And as we walked through that cemetery, we noticed that some had been buried in, in the 1800s. It was that old. But we also noticed a handful of tombstones that just had a solitary date on them, just one date. In other words, this was a child that had died the very day that it had been born. And I can't imagine the devastation that such a family experienced, even though such occurrences perhaps were more common hundreds of years ago than they are today. Well, we can only imagine as well how devastated these two disciples of Jesus were at this moment. I can imagine them saying, why, Lord? Why did you allow Jesus, a man who had helped so many people, who had performed so many miracles, who had even raised people from the dead, the one that we thought would redeem Israel, why did you allow him, Lord, to be cut down, to be horribly killed in the prime of his life and ministry? The truth is that for us, there are many things that happen that we don't understand, that we can't explain. I think this is what vexed perhaps the author of the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, who, though he had a knowledge of the Old Testament, saw that life seemed to be so random, that life seemed to be so unfair at times, that even the righteous who sought to please God suffered the same misfortunes and heartaches as did those who thumbed their noses at the Lord. Well, lo and behold, the resurrected Christ comes up alongside these two distraught disciples, one of whom we're told was named Cleopas. And they were on their way to a small village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And when Jesus joins them in their journey, they're in the midst of a very intense conversation about the very traumatic events of that first Easter weekend. But what is perhaps most surprising is that we're told that they did not recognize Jesus, that their eyes were kept from recognizing him. You know, the Bible promises that for those who love God, all things work together for good. But we are, when we are in the midst of a very trying and painful circumstance, it can be very difficult for us to see that good. It can be very difficult for us to recognize the Lord, to see His hand in our circumstances. But notice again what the text actually says. It says their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Who or what was keeping them from recognizing Jesus? Well, it's very likely that the Lord supernaturally concealed his identity for his own purposes. However, we can also be certain they weren't expecting Jesus, right? They weren't looking for Jesus. They assumed he was still dead and they figured they would never see Jesus again. And so at least in part, their own pre preconceived mindset, their own settled convictions were keeping them from recognizing Jesus. Notice how Jesus plays dumb, so to speak. He says, what's going on? Why are you guys all upset? What, what, what things happened in Jerusalem? And they were, they were dumbfounded. You know, how could this man not know? How could he be so ignorant of what was taking place in recent days in Jerusalem. But what they'll discover shortly is their own ignorance, their own ignorance about the identity of the Messiah. I don't know about you, but I find that when I pray about a matter that is troubling me, I sometimes find when I pray it out loud or verbalize it, it helps give me insight into my situation. And I think that is the reason why Jesus asked them these questions, not because he didn't know, obviously he knew, right? 
And now, of course, when we pray, God already knows all about our situation, but Jesus wanted to hear them express in their own words what it was that was troubling them. And you know, that's the basis of any good relationship, right? Communication, allowing ourselves to reveal to others what we're feeling, what we're experiencing, and having the give and take that's in a good relationship. I and mean, God is the same way. He wants to hear us. He wants us to talk to Him and to express to Him our deepest hurts, our deepest troubles, the things that are weighing on our hearts and lives. Now, some of you may say, well, it would be nice if He talked back, right? It would be nice if the Lord would talk back to us. Well, the truth is He does. He does talk back. But many times we miss what he is saying because of our own preconceived notions, because of our own prior convictions about what the Lord can or cannot do in a situation. These men admit that they're aware of the fact that the tomb is empty, right? They admit that they're aware of the report of these women who said they talked with angels who told them Jesus was alive, facts that were at least partially confirmed by other disciples. So the Lord had already been speaking to them. He had already been communicating. In fact, everything that happened that weekend was in fulfillment of things that Jesus had already told them months and maybe even years prior to the events of that first week, weekend. But for some reason, these men, like the other 12, were not listening. I read a column last Sunday about a, by a local Jewish rabbi who says he refuses to believe that the current pandemic is, in fact, a punishment from God. Now, I can't authoritatively tell you this morning what God's agenda is for this pandemic, what precisely his purposes are for allowing this pandemic to afflict the whole world. But I can tell you on the authority of God's word that what is happening is a vivid reminder of a very basic biblical truth, and that is death, any death, is a punishment for sin. As the Apostle Paul writes in the book of Romans, sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men or all people. Why? Because all have sinned. The truth is God never intended that for those that he created in his own image that they should die. But when our first parents deliberately chose to disobey the only prohibition the Lord had given them, they experienced the penalty that he had promised them. Now, I don't think this means that everyone who dies from this pandemic is dying for specific sins in their lives, but it is a reminder that all death is a consequence of the fact that we are all sinners before a holy God. And so a question I think we should be asking ourselves is, are we listening? Are we paying attention? Are we hearing what the Lord is saying to us? Are we attentive and obedient to what he has already revealed to us? Or are we, like so many, choosing to disregard his voice, even in the midst of a very serious pandemic? Well, we continue the story in verse 25. Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. 
Here we see Jesus chastises these two disciples, not because they're sorrowful and grieving, but because they are unbelieving. He chastises them because they have not embraced the full truth about the Messiah that God had already revealed in his word. And as a result, their incomplete understanding was in conflict with the events that had recently taken place in Jerusalem, leading them to unnecessarily suffer a sorrow that they did not need to suffer. But in mercy and in grace, Jesus leads them in a study of the Old Testament to explain to them all that the Old Testament scriptures affirm about himself. I don't know about you, but that was one Bible study I wish I had been a part of. Well, even though they have been further enlightened by Jesus, they still don't recognize it that Jesus himself is the one who is teaching them. Look at verse 28. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, and Jesus acted as if he were going further. But he, they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. And they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those that were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Isn't it ironic that after so many amazing miracles that Jesus had performed in his three years of ministry, he chooses to reveal himself to these men through the simple act of saying grace. That's basically what happened. As I said earlier, when we are in pain, we often struggle to see the Lord, to see his hand in our circumstances. But our gracious God is more than willing to reveal himself to anyone who recognizes their need for him and comes to him in humility. Here's the lesson that I want you to take away from this morning's message, and that is this. When your world is shattered, your greatest recourse is the only one who can rebuild it. And of course, that one person is Jesus Christ. This world is broken, isn't it? We see evidences of that all around us every day. And, and try as we might as human beings, we can't seem to fix it. How long? Have things been the way they are? Hundreds, even thousands of years. We keep making the same dreadful choices. We keep hurting one another over and over again in our, in our families, in our marriages, in our churches, in our communities, even in our world. But into this brokenness came one the only one who can heal our hurts, who can truly bring peace, truly transform our hearts and our desires. As the Old Testament prophet Isaiah put it, some 700 years before Jesus entered this world, um, before this Good Friday that we just observed, he says, surely, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us 
peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. The first step, the first step to rebuilding your broken, your shattered world is to acknowledge that you can't do it. You can't. Instead, in humility, you must receive the free gift of God's unconditional forgiveness and his promise of eternal life that is provided only through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And once you have done that, then you can come again and again and again to this man of sorrows who was acquainted with grief and cast your grief upon him. He wants you to talk to him. He wants you to tell him about it. And he desires to comfort you with a peace that passes understanding. That is his promise in his word. He doesn't always take it away. He doesn't always make new what has been broken, but he promises that he is with us and that he will minister to us and he will stay with us until that day that he calls us to himself. You know, a statement we've been hearing quite frequently in this pandemic is we're all in this together. We're all in this together. Yet despite that fact, there are so many that are feeling so alone. Even before this pandemic struck, statistics were showing that a very large percentage of American society was dealing with intense loneliness. And worse, such loneliness leads to an increase of early death for those who are suffering from it. When we were experiencing deep emotional or spiritual pain, it's quite common to feel as if God himself has left us alone. But the truth is, God abandoned his own son for just a couple of hours in order that we might someday enjoy eternity with him. And that eternity begins the moment, the very moment that we place our faith in Christ as our Savior. As we just read in the prophet Isaiah, he is the one who bore the punishment, the punishment we deserved. He bore that punishment for our sin and died a death that he didn't deserve, but that we deserved. And then three days later, he arose from that grave and he appeared to these two disciples on their way to Emmaus. He appeared to the 11. He appeared to the women. He appeared to more than 500 people, according to the Apostle Paul. Absolute proof that death could not hold him and he is alive forevermore. And as we continue this service, I want to give you an opportunity to make that most important decision of asking Christ, if you have never done it before, of inviting Christ into your life.
Stay. 
crimson stain he washed did white as snow he washed did white as snow he washed did white as snow oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. I don't need to tell you that our culture is fascinated by superheroes, both in movies and in books and in other ways. And yet the truth is, there is only one superhero. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the only one that can rebuild our broken and shattered world and restore us to the kind of relationship that God intended all along that we might enjoy in His presence. I want to give you the opportunity before we end this service today, if you have never done this before, to ask Christ to be your Savior. If you have that desire, I'm going to say a prayer right now. And in the quietness of your heart, you can repeat these words after me. If you truly believe them, repeat these words and speak them to the Lord. Would you bow with me? Lord, I acknowledge that I am a sinner, that I cannot save myself. I acknowledge, Lord, that I have offended you over and over and over again. But I believe that Jesus did die for me, that he took the punishment for my sin. And Lord, the best I know how, I invite you into my life. I ask you to cleanse me of my sin, to forgive me of all sin, and to grant me that eternal life that you have promised as a free gift. Lord, from this day forward, help me to be your disciple as those early disciples followed you in so many ways. My desire is to follow you as well until you call me to yourself. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love to know about that. Please take the time to reach out to me or one of the pastors at Christian Fellowship Church or someone you know from CFC and let them know of this decision, this most important decision. We want to come alongside of you 
and help you to grow in your Christian faith. Have a great remainder of Easter and may the Lord bless you today, tomorrow, and until he comes again.